I think where we left off was um, if we're building an algorithm that's going to choose what state we're in, and we've got a whole bunch of different buttons and a whole bunch of different states, what kinds of issues or sort of you know edge cases, unusual things that can happen, do we need to be do we need to be prepared for? So for, for example, what happens if someone presses two buttons at the same time, or what should happen if someone presses two buttons at the same time? Should it do both? So if we imagine that we set an option, that's something that we could have it do. Um, in most cases, the states that we have are mutually exclusive. So um, you generally can't go into two at the same time. So if we've got the um, elevator, for example, it can't go to two set points at the same time. So what are some other options for uh, what, what it should do? Could you have it as defaults? And have it to whichever one is a higher priority, have it go to that one, or more exactly. likely yeah, to be what we actually want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we can, we'll, we'll want to set up some sort of priority list for, um, you know, if it, it, again, if it gets two commands at the same time, which, you know, priorities that it knows which command it should actually do. So that's exactly right. So what I want to use as an example first, before we get to the elevators, the elevator system, is how we controlled the butterfly modules um, last year. So the butterfly modules really only had uh, two states, right? They were either in butterfly mode or in traction mode. And so you might ask yourself, well, why do we need a fancy state controller if there's only two output states? Well, the other thing that the state controller can help us with is the situation where we have a lot of different ways to control the butterfly modules. So, for example, for the butterfly modules, um, we had, oops, come on. Apparently, I can't edit a comment anymore. Edit comment. There we go. So, with the butterfly modules, we actually had four, well, five, but we're only going to talk about four today, different things that were controlling whether the butterfly modules were deployed or retracted. So, there were two different buttons, the right bumper and the left bumper on the joystick that could flip between butterfly and traction mode then the robot had to put itself into butterfly mode before it jumped off of the hab at the very beginning. When the robot was in auto-targeting mode, it had to make sure that it was in butterfly. And then also when the robot elevator raised up above a certain height, in order to keep it from rocking too much, it also put it in self automatically in butterfly. And so we had to design a system that was able to handle these very different ways of controlling the butterfly modules in a way that would resolve different conflicts. Does anyone have any questions about the different ways that we had to control the butterfly modules and, and why that was sort of a unique situation? Okay. So let me save this real quick. The way that we the state type of state controller that we designed for the butterfly modules is something that we call uh, an injection state controller. And the way that that functions is the following. So if we make an indicator that is the butterfly state, so if it's true, we'll call that butterfly mode. And if it's false, we'll call that traction mode. <clears throat> what we do is we take a feedback node 
And we're going to initialize that feedback node to the default state for the butterfly modules, which last year needed to be traction. And the reason it needed to be traction was the robot was actually too tall for the starting configuration uh, when it was up on the butterfly modules. And so we need to make sure we were always starting in traction, which is false. So let's make a note here. False equals traction and true equals uh, butterfly. Okay. And the way an injection works is we take a whole bunch of little select blocks. And if our event doesn't happen, we keep going with the value that we had stored in the feedback node. So we basically make no changes to the state. And then if something does happen here, then we're going to put in our new value. So we've got trigger for something that happens, which is the middle line. And then we have the, uh, we'll call it the injected state, which is what's going to go into the upper part of the select block. <clears throat> and so for each one of these four different things that can change how the um, butterfly modules are deployed, we're going to have a, a select block. Are there any questions with the feedback node and how we would inject a new value into the state and actually change the state? Okay. So uh, now comes a little bit of a hard part. So let's think about the following. If we've got, well, here, let's, let, let me ask this question first. Would we want to control the butterfly modules using one button or two buttons? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of those options? And maybe, maybe since Adam has driven, maybe Adam can, can talk about that a little bit. I'm not sure if Adam has audio. I just see his phone, his phone connected. Uh, I can pick on Ethan again. He's driven. Could you repeat the question real quick? Sure, yeah. So the question is, you know, if we've got the butterfly modules, you sort of have two yep. options, right? We can have one button that toggles back and forth between butterfly and traction or one button mm -hmm. that always puts it in attraction and another button that always puts it in the butterfly. And, and what are your thoughts on uh, which one we should use? Um, I would like just saying like preference from a driver. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I would say one button. One button, okay, so why? Yeah, um, I think it'd be easier for me just to remember, like I just have to click that button, so. I just changed the state that way. So it's, okay. it has a default state, but I just changed between it. Okay. So let's go ahead and write the code for that one. Um, and then we're going to write it also how we did it last year, which is we actually had two buttons because that was the driver preference last year. Um, so but let's do it for one button first. <clears throat> so let me make uh, a button here. So we'll call this um, button. A. Okay. So, and this is on the joystick. So, what should we do in order to uh, have button A toggle between uh, the two modes? What do we need? Also got Alex on here. We've got Amelie and Lindsay. Who wants to who wants to talk about what do we need to toggle between the two modes? With button A. Mm. 
Okay, so Amelie says we need a knot. We are going to need a knot for sure. Um, what else are we going to need here? You guys are going to have to guide me through this one. All right, Alex, I'm going to pick on you. I know your dad will make you answer. He was waiting for that. Uh, do we need an, is it just like a rising edge trigger? We are going to need a rising edge trigger. So why don't you walk me through building a rising edge trigger? It'll be a bit of a review. But don't we make that a sub VI and that can be pulled in? We do have it as a sub VI. Um, tell you what. We'll pull in as a sub VI the rising edge trigger, but you are going to guide us through making the toggle, okay? Sure. Okay, awesome. So to pull it in as a sub VI, what I'm going to do is go to our toolbox. I'm going to grab the edge trigger sub VI. <clears throat> I'm just going to make a copy of it in the training uh, code. That way we don't have any conflicts. I'm gonna go ahead and drag and drop that in here. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, the way that the edge trigger sub VI works is we've got one input and three outputs. And so our input is our button. And then we have uh, three outputs, a rising edge, a falling edge, and then what Ethan was describing earlier, which is uh, we'll get a trigger on either a falling edge or a rising edge. Okay, Alex, so we've bypassed making the edge trigger. So we've got our rising edge trigger here. What do we need to do to uh, make the, the toggle? So if there's a rising edge, like it's true, then you need to get the value from the button and then knot it and then put it into the, um, the true side and then the rising edge true will come to the middle of the select block. Okay. So something like <clears throat> this. Um uh, yeah, actually I guess we can sort of you go ahead and hook it up here, right? You don't need another one. Okay, we that's could do that, right? Mm -hmm. Let me clean that up a little bit. And I'll put that one over here. Okay. And so this is the manual control of the butterfly drive. Does anyone have, and I guess you know, let me, let's make sure it works. So let me just put a loop around the whole thing so we can see if it works. And I'll make that bigger. So when we press it, it toggles. That, that seems like the behavior we wanted, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Does anyone have any questions on, on this portion of the state controller? Okay. So let's go ahead and look then at, uh, we'll skip the hab for a second. Let's go ahead and look at Stabilization, that's an easy one to sort of look at. So <clears throat> if we assume that we've got already a button 
Now let's make it make it this so it's a little bit easier to differentiate. We'll call this one whether or not the elevator is too high. And so if it's true, that means that we should deploy the uh, we should deploy the um, butterfly module to help stabilize. And if it's false, then uh, we don't need to deploy the butterfly modules. So we've got this one. How would we now integrate this this trigger with uh, the state controller? So what's the what's the first thing that we're going to need? What's the first block in order to add another injection? Lindsay, how about you? What's the first block that we need to add another injection? Select, I think. Yep, exactly. So where do you think, Lindsay? Should we put the select before or after this select? So sort of help with that. That's sort of a you know, an interesting question. The one of the things that we talked about at the beginning is we need a way to prior we need a way to prioritize the uh, the different options, right? Because someone could be pressing the manual control button, and the elevator could be going back and forth between between being too high or not too high. So let's ask this question first: Which one should be higher priority? The stabilization for the robot or the manual control for the butterfly modules. Stabilization so the robot doesn't destroy itself. OK, sounds good to me. I like that. Um, if the data are flowing, so if we've got to see back, you know, the data basically flow in this loop. So I guess that's uh, clockwise, right? So where should we put? This select block so that it's higher, so that its injection is higher priority than the manual control. I guess wouldn't it go after it because the feedback node would want to take the most important? Yep. Or would you? Okay. Yep, no, you're exactly right. So if we put it here afterwards, then whatever injection happens here is going to completely overwrite whatever injection happened here. <clears throat> and so everything, things that are further downstream, so further to the right, are going to be a higher priority than things to the left. So if we take this one and put this one all the way over here. This one gets to be pretty simple because the injection that we have is always going to be a, is always going to be a true. We're always going to be going into butterfly mode to stabilize us. Does anyone have any questions about how um, the stabilization is always higher priority and will always win out in the decision making process, or in how we're doing the injection here? Okay, so let's go to the next one. So we've done stabilize and we've done manual control. Let's look at autopilot. So the way it worked last year, the autopilot, which we didn't use that much, um, was only tuned for the robot in butterfly mode. So in order for autopilot to work, whenever we went into autopilot, we wanted it to, to also go into butterfly mode so that the tuning would be correct. So where should we put the select block for where do you, what, where do you think priority wise the autopilot control should the autopilot injection should go
Should an autopilot go after manual control but before stabilization? Sounds good to me. I like that. So we're always going to keep the robot safe, but when we're doing something automated, we take away some control from the drivers. So we can do that one. And this injection is also going to be uh, a true. We're also going to be going into butterfly mode. And I'll make another switch here. So call this one uh, auto pilot. I guess we should run this and make sure these work. So let's just see here. So right now the elevator is down and we're not on autopilot. So pressing the manual button should allow us to control it. But if we do go with the elevator too high, no matter what we do to the button, we stay in butterfly mode. And um, same with autopilot, if we're in autopilot, we're not, nothing happens when we press the button. Do the autopilot and elevator too high injections make sense to everyone? Or are there any questions? Okay. So, let's see here. This last one that we have marked on here is driving off of the hab. So we want to make sure that, so the robot's going to start in traction. So let me make a note here. So it is start in traction. And we want the robot to go into butterfly mode. And what we decided last year, which is very game specific, is that we wanted the robot to go into butterfly mode as soon as the drivers pressed forward on the um, as soon as the drivers pressed forward on the joysticks. So basically, as soon as they start driving during autonomous, we didn't have an autonomous that year. So as soon as they start driving in hybrid mode, uh, the robot would switch into um, the robot would switch into butterfly mode. So priority wise, where should, where do you think that the drive off the hab, make sure that we're in butterfly mode um, uh, injection should go? Would it go after autopilot? Sure, we can do that. That one's, you know, sort of open to however you want to prioritize stuff. I don't see any problems with putting it after autopilot. It will again be a true injection. So it just the way it worked out with the butterfly modules last year, most of the injections were to force us into butterfly mode. And there weren't really many things that forced us into traction. So that's why you've got a lot of trees here. So <clears throat> let me go ahead and make a control that will be the joystick value. So we're just gonna have this numeric control and this will be um, joystick value. Okay. So taking this joystick value, how should we trigger this injection for the uh, coming off the hab?
So I've got a I've got a number here, and when this number is above a certain value, so when the drivers are pressing forward on the joystick, we want to inject this true for when we're coming off the half. What do we need to use? All right, Alex, I'm looking at you. Oh, we got it. Adam's put in a greater than zero. All right. Then go to the numeric uh, palette. We can grab a, so we could grab a greater than zero. Um, nothing in this example that would work great. I am, however, going to grab a greater than sign instead of a greater than zero. And the reason I'm doing that is because we are working with floating point numbers, the, the orange values. And depending on how those floating point numbers are stored and transferred in the computer, sometimes they can be a little bit wrong. And so if we get a zero value where the joystick isn't moving, um, it could all of a sudden look like it's above zero. And so instead of making it when it's above zero, I'm going to make it when it's above a small number. So let's we'll say zero point. Zero one, so one percent instead of um, uh, instead of exactly zero, and we'll use that as a trigger. So this option would work in this example, but this option is a little bit more robust when we're running the actual robot out there on the field. Are there any questions with this little section right here? Yes. So now this question is for Alex. What is the problem with this piece of code that we've just written? As we're, imagine the robot driving around on the field. I want you to think about what this, what problem we may have just introduced. If we go backwards. What happens if we go backwards? It doesn't trigger. Okay. So what can we do to fix that? That wasn't the issue I was thinking of, but that's an issue. What should we do to fix that? If it's that, or if it's um, less than negative point one. Okay, let's do that. While I'm writing that, why don't you think about what other issues there could be? Because there's there's another one. Luke, is it that maybe it's triggers that even when we're not at the beginning of the match? Mm hmm And so what would happen if that's triggering when we're not at the beginning of the match? Um stuff we don't want it to do. So walk walk through the state controller. And so if this is running during the match, you're exactly right, that's where the problem is. Yes. What what is that doing to the robot? Um, it's constantly forcing it and when you're driving in the butterfly, even if you want to be pushing with your traction. Exactly. Yep, exactly. So what Alex is saying is that <clears throat> as long as you're driving, it's pushing you into butterfly mode, regardless of whatever else is happening before it. And that could be kind of frustrating for the driver, right? Every time they drive forward or backwards, all of a sudden they're in butterfly mode. So and this is a question I don't know that you guys don't know the answer yet, but does anyone have any thoughts on things that we could do to keep that from happening? You use a true false, and when the match starts, you flip a button and you have a feedback node. Okay, so we do need a feedback node. We could do that. Um, so let me grab a feedback node. So what am I what am I doing with this feedback? So let me ask you this question. Um, at a very high level, without thinking about it as code, what should the behavior be? Like, what should the behavior of this injection be? A one-time thing. Okay, a one-time thing, exactly. So, any thoughts on how we could make it a one-time thing? And you don't have to know the answer to this one. We need, like, a count on, like, when we, like, 
do it. Like when it's pushed forward for the first time, mm -hmm. like a counter, like when it gets pushed and it like equals one, then it does it. And then it does okay. it. Okay. So um, what do we need to see the event where we go from not pushing it to pushing it? Because we're going to count that event, right? Rising edge. Awesome. Okay. So I'll grab the rising edge. And we will put that here. So now we have a way to get a true value every time that we go from not pushing the stick forward or backwards um, to pushing the stick forward or backwards. Um, and you're right, Alex, we could count each one of those and say that if it is greater than a certain number, uh, like greater than one, then we don't actually do the action. There's a slightly simpler option that we can do with just Boolean logic called a latch. And so let me show you guys how to build a latch. So if we take, we're going to need this feedback node and we're going to go ahead and initialize it to false. So we want this latch. Uh, so when I say the word latch, it really means just like a gate latch. So once it, once you close the switch, or in this case, set the switch to true, it should stay, or let me say that again. If the, once it's been set, it shouldn't be able to be unset, at least not easily. And so what we can do here is the following. <clears throat> so we need a way, actually, so let me change this. I'm going to go back on my statement and, and make that a true. So if we build an and here, what we've done is make it so that we're only going to do the injection when we get the rising edge trigger and the value that's stored in this feedback node is true. <clears throat> now, if we just do this, this is going to behave exactly the same as if we didn't have this feedback node here at all, right? It's going to, this is always going to be true. And so we're always going to be able to, uh, in, we're always going to be injecting um, the true value here. So what we need to do is switch this to false only when uh, we want to. So let me do let's see, the following here. Um, you have to make a little bit more. Um, it's the easiest way. So this is one of those cases where um, the order of execution starts to become important in LabVIEW. And so I'm going to do uh, a little bit of a goofy thing here. And let's see, I want to, what's the best way to do this? There's like an easy way to do it, but it looks kind of ugly and makes it kind of hard to understand. So I'm going to go the long way, a little bit easier to read. So um, what we want to happen is basically, you know, if you think of this, this here as another version of this state controller, we want to do an injection of a false into this counter here. And let me let me pause and make sure I'm not skipping over a step real quick. Um, <clears throat> I 
Okay. Sorry, that took a second for me to make sure that that was in the correct order and not going to look ugly. Um, okay. So what's happening here is we've still got our edge trigger that goes true only when we have a rising edge. We have this little feedback node loop that starts out as true. And so let's assume that we haven't driven forward yet. So this is false and this is true. <clears throat> we're both gonna, we're gonna go into the and. We've got a true and a false. So we're gonna get a false here. That means that when we, so we get a false, so we're going to grab the value from the false on this select. And this is a true from the feedback node. And so we're gonna keep having that true coming through this loop, right? Now, if we do start driving forward, we're going to get a true here. We've still got a true in this line. We're going to and them, so we're going to get a true. So we'll get our trigger to inject the true into this state controller. But now, because we've put a true in here, we're going to inject a false into this section. And so from now on, the value in the feedback node is going to be false, and there's never any way for us to get a true on this line. So there's always going to be one false input into the AND. And so we're always going to stay in false, and we're never going to get another trigger, and we're never going to do anything else to this feedback node. So it's going to stay latched as a, as a false. Are there any questions on that on the latch. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So those are the, uh, the, the four that I wanted to cover in this example. Um, there is actually, there was actually a fifth thing that we also had to deal with. Um, we added a defensive driving pushing button where when the driver held down on the, actually let's make sure this works before I go on to that. So if I'm running this, I can toggle this back and forth just fine. Um, if I run my joystick, I'll put this in butterfly, but I still have control over this. And then the elevator or the uh, autopilot still forces us into butterfly. So that, that is doing what we want it to do. Just want to make sure that, that was easy to see. Um, so the the fifth thing that we had to worry about was we added this button where if the driver pressed down on one of the driver sticks, the robot would drop into traction. And the only difference between that button and say, you know, the stabilization where we just inject a false is we wanted the robot to return to the state that it was in before the, ro before the driver pressed the button after they released the button. So if the robot was in butterfly and they pressed the traction button, we wanted to memorize that it was in butterfly. And then when they release the traction button, put it back into butterfly for the driver. And then if it was in traction when they pressed the button, um, it should memorize that it was in traction and when they release the button, it should stay in traction. So um, that one's a little bit, you know, took a little bit more time out. We have time to go through that today. Um, but if I have a chance, I'll, I'll post the code for that one too. So we actually had five different ways to control the butterfly modules last year. Are there any questions on the injection state controller before I move on to the next 
type of state controller that we use. Okay, so my plan here is I'm gonna go for about an hour on the injection, even though we started late, I'm gonna go for about an hour on the state controllers and then go for about an hour people can stay um, for the PID control. We're just sort of see where we're at. And if people can't stay um, past four, then we'll just um, uh, start continuing with the PID controllers in the next in the next session. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So that was how we controlled the um, uh, butterfly modules. The let's see. All right. So now I want to talk about how we controlled the elevator last year. So the way we can, so the, the, the way the elevator worked last year was that we had, you know, all of these different buttons on the tablet and patients could press any of the buttons at any time and um, command it to go to a new state. And we had the same sort of issues where we need to have a priority um, so that if patients press two buttons at the same time, uh, we wouldn't have a conflict. Um, we wouldn't try and do two things at once or start doing one thing and then switch to another thing halfway through. And um, we had, a, you know, basically fundamentally had a bunch of buttons. Now the way we actually did it last year was we manually wrote code for each individual button, which was sort of a pain. So we've come up with a much simpler way to do it this year and it's how we're controlling the different speed set points when patients was pressing the speed set point buttons on a tablet this year for the shooter. And we've done that by incorporating all of these buttons into an array and doing all of these operations as arrays. And so what I mean by all these operations are things like rising edge triggers. So uh, again, because we don't want to have conflicts and we don't want to have issues where someone's like pressing the button and holding the button down, um, we want to put a rising edge trigger on every single one of these buttons. So we only get true pulses when the button is initially pressed. And then we'll have something after that that converts those true pulses, which could happen at the same time, into a specific robot state. And we could put a rising edge trigger. We could take, you know, um, uh, uh, we could take this block and we could put one in between each one of these booleans and the array, right? We could hook this up like this. That starts to get a little bit messy. And so what it turns out is that you can do an edge trigger with an array. So all we have to do is build a normal edge trigger. So we're gonna need our feedback node. I'm gonna go ahead and initialize the feedback node to the values at the very first loop cycle, which theoretically should all be falses. Um, theoretically, patient doesn't press the buttons and isn't holding them down at the time that the robot boots, although it wouldn't necessarily be a problem if she did do that. And then um, we have an and. And so for a rising edge, we need the current value to be true. And we need the previous value to be false. And this, sorry, needs to be hooked up. Um, oh no, that's fine. I can be, I can stay like that. <clears throat> so this is exactly our rising edge trigger from before except that if you look, the uh, wires are thicker because they're arrays. And so what it's doing is it's doing this rising edge trigger for each one of the four elements of the array. And it's doing it in a very nice and compact form without us having to have 
a whole bunch of, of rising edge trigger blocks. Is that, does the, do the rising edge triggers make sense to everyone? In this sort of array format. Okay. So we've got these button presses. We have a way to see when the buttons are just initially pressed. And what we want to do is convert the button presses into a name for a state. So we've got four names, state A, state B, state C, and state D. And those could be, you know, elevator set point, uh, you know, for the rocket, and then one for the cargo ship, and then a stow, and, um, you know, maybe one for climbing. And <clears throat> the way we're going to do the names is we're going to create an array of names, just like we've created an array of button values. And we could build an array like this, and that would be totally fine. I want to show you another option here, though, which is <clears throat> we can go here on the front panel and go to uh, data containers and array, and we're going to call this state names. Now, this array has nothing, no data type associated with it right now, so that's why it's black and grayed out. To make it one that we can put names in, we need, a, we need string values. So we're going to go to the string palette and grab a string control and just drop it inside of the state names array. And so now the, the control has turned pink because it's going to be for um, names. This allows us to just drag this down and type in the names that we want. Now, the reason that I wanted to do it this way is because I also want to show a, so this can be very convenient. It can be very easy to do this and be able to change these things on the fly and it can be very easy to see the variables that you're setting. So, but there is a problem that you just need to be aware of. So right now we've got the little asterisk up in the corner that's saying that I haven't saved this file. I'm going to go ahead and save it now. So I have, I have saved the file. And I'm going to close the file. And can anyone who's maybe done some of the live view before tell me what's going to happen when I open that file again? That was um, multi state bun sign. Can anyone tell me what's going to, what we're going to find when I open that, that sub BI? My guesses. What happened to the names that we typed in? Alex, what stuff did we forget? What step did we forget? Why don't we have any names typed into the, the into this array? An initialization, an initialization step. I don't remember. Right. Amelie. So, so Amelie just came to them in the chat. So, Amelie is saying that we forgot to set the values as default. That's correct. So let's type in all of the values again. I remember that. I did that a couple times on accident. <laughs> it can it can always be sad when you. Uh, set something up and then forget it. So what's happening here is if you type anything into the front panel, it goes away when you close the sub VI unless you right click on the object and go to data operations and say make current value default. And then you can hit save. And now if we close this VI and open it again, our names will be saved. You can also do this by going to File, um, or sorry, Edit, and say Make Current Values Default. That will do it for every single control that is sitting 
on the front panel. So you don't necessarily want to do that all the time, but you, you can if you want to. Um, <clears throat> usually it's easier just to right click on the specific one that you want to save and, and make those values default. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions about making those values default? Okay. So now we have an array of, of uh, button presses and an array of our different state names. And we want to build the conversion between these button presses and these state names. And this one, I'm just sort of going to walk you guys through because it's, um, it's not necessarily complicated, but it uses some things that we haven't quite covered yet. And so I'm going to use this to cover those, those options. So in order to work with these arrays, we're going to want to index through those arrays. And I know that when we've indexed through arrays before in, say, the sensor fusion lecture, we used a for loop. However, we're also going to need a feedback node or sorry, you're also going to need some memory. And so we're actually going to do in a while loop what we did in a for loop. Um, so this kind of goes back to the fact that you can usually take a while loop and do pretty much anything that you can in a for loop. So I'm going to take this while loop here. And we need to be able to cycle, we need to be able to check the values on each individual one of these button presses in this array. And so if we run this array over, we can right click on this tunnel. So right now the tunnel is solid. You can right click on the tunnel and say enable indexing. And now we actually have an indexing, um, now we actually have an indexing tunnel just like we would on a for loop. It's a little bit more steps to get there, but um, we can do that. And what we're going to want to do is also like a for loop. Um, we want to only loop, we want to loop exactly the same number of times as we have elements in the array. So we can go to the array palette, we can recover the size of the array, and then we have our counter here. <clears throat> and if I remember correctly, the counter starts at zero, I think. We'll need to double check that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we can get a greater than. And so let's see if the number of times that we've looped through is greater than the size of the array, we need to stop. And I want to double check something real quick and make sure that we may need a uh, subtraction by negative one here just to make sure that that works out. So let me go back to my notes. Um, uh, greater than or equal to, and that will be our, our subtraction. So what this is saying is that if the number of iterations is greater than or equal to the size of the array, which in this case is four, we should stop. So, you know, if we're on iteration number three, we're not going to stop. We're going to loop one more time. If we're on iteration number four here, we're going to stop the loop as soon as we finish executing this loop cycle. So we'll do, iter we will perform iteration number four, but we won't perform iteration number five. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions on how we do the stopping of the while loop here and why we're doing it? Okay. So the next thing that's going on here is and the reason that we're using a while loop instead of a for loop is what we want to do is if any of these triggers are true, we want to go ahead 
and inject the state name for the current for for the uh, the associated state. And if the triggers are false, we don't want to change anything. So we need some memory so we can keep track of the state that we've been in. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and right click and say um, add shift registers. That's how we're going to store one piece of memory. And I'm going to go ahead and connect this, and we're going to need to change this, but for right now I'm going to go ahead and connect it here. And what I'm going to say is, oops, anytime we press one of these buttons, oh here. So if we if we if the button is not pressed, we're just going to take the previous value for the state. Oh, sorry, that's a mistake. One second. One second. Sorry, so this is the list of, of, of available states. What we need is the state itself. So I'm just going to go ahead and call, start with, make our default state A. So this value here that is sitting in the feedback nodes, this is the current state. Okay. And if none of the, if the trigger isn't true, we're going to keep it. We're not going to change it. And if it is true, we're going to essentially look up the uh, associated state name and replace it. So we've got this list of states that are in the same order as the buttons. And I'm going to double check something again. Okay, that works. And again, I'm going to make this auto indexing so that the value that's coming out of the, the value that's being indexed out of the state names array is going to correspond to the value that's being indexed out of the, the triggers array. So as we cycle through, right, we're going to look at the state A button first. If the state A button is false, we're going to pass through <coughs> the old value and we're going to keep that in memory. On the next loop cycle, we're going to look at state the state B button. And if it is false, we're still going to keep the, the previous state and remember it. And now if we get to the state C button and it is true, then we're going to grab the state C name out of the index and insert that into memory. And so now we've got state C here. And if the state B button is false, we will stay at state C. But if state D button is true, then we're going to put in a D. So the, the D value, the buttons here are in order of priority. So D is a higher priority than C, and C is a higher priority than B, and B is a higher priority than A. So basically, whichever button here is last pressed, or if you press two buttons at the same time, it's going to go with the button at the bottom of the array. Does this portion right here make sense to everyone? Okay, so we could then immediately hook this up, okay, and Here's the thing though, so <clears throat> if we run this code inside of this big while loop, does anyone know what's going to happen when we loop back around and do the and do the outer loop again? Wouldn't it restart the inner loop? It would. And so we would go right back to being at state A, because we're going to fill this feedback and we're going to initialize this feedback node again with state A. 
And so to avoid that problem, we actually need another piece of memory that isn't tied to this loop. And so, you know, we could put, you know, another set of shift registers here. Um, it'll be a little bit cleaner to do a feedback node, but um, you could do shift registers on the outer loop. So if we put a feedback node here, we can now remember what the state was from the previous loop cycle. And so if instead we do this, when we come back around, we're gonna initialize this feedback node, this inner piece of memory with the value that it was, uh, with the value that we determined from the previous loop cycle. Does that make sense to everyone? Right. So let's see if that works. So we've got our, our four buttons here and we've got the, the name of the state that we've selected. And so hopefully if we press state C, we should go to state C, B, D, A. It doesn't matter how fast you press them. It's always gonna go to the correct state. Does that make sense to everyone? So now we've selected the, the name of the state. <clears throat> Typically what happens is that this can now be run into a case structure as the, uh, as the control basically. And you can now go through and you can name the case structures appropriately. So state A, state B, right click, say add case after, go to state C, right click, go add case after state B. And now if we have something like, um, we'll call it the elevator height. So this will be elevator, height in inches, let me make that a lot bigger so we can see it. What we can basically do is inside of this case structure, we can have different height set points. So if I just grab this and we'll say that state A we're at height of zero, you want to be at a height of zero inches. And in state B, let's be at a height of um, 30 inches. And in state C, let's do 40. In state D, let's do 60 inches. And so now, if we click run, whenever we press the corresponding button, the output from the state controller can be our elevator set points. <coughs> and we can put as many things as we want inside of the case structure. So we can do more and more complicated things based on what state we're in now that we've got this system set up. Does anyone have any questions on um, on this portion so far. So the last two things that I wanna cover in state controllers are related. And they're how we handle sort of safety cases and, and, they, and, and safety interlocks. So the first one is when we are moving between states, sometimes the configuration of the robot is such that it would be unsafe to go into a specific other configuration. So a good example of that is last year, um, the, the elevator needed to be all the way retracted before, um, the elevator needed to be all the way retracted before we started the client sequence. If we went into the client state with the elevator extended, 
really horrible things that happen. And so we need a way to, based on the state of the robot, prevent the robot, prevent the human operator from going into certain states at certain times. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that. The way that we chose to do it this year, which is different than how we chose to do it last year, is by constantly maintaining a list of, of states that are not allowed at given, at given points in time. So we can build another array. I'm just gonna copy, well, I'm gonna just build another array here. And I'm gonna start out with saying that all of the states are allowed. And then if we, <clears throat> so this is now like a list of an array of allowed states. <clears throat> and we can replace this and if we go to, if we right click on it and go to replace and go to compound arithmetic, we can now and more than two values together at a time. We can drag down and have three ports. And so now in order for the, oh my goodness, select. In order for us to get a trigger off one of a true poles here, the corresponding array has to be allowed at that given time. And so if we just run this one, everything should act the exact same as before. But if for whatever reason, that state, state B is not allowed and so if that state's not allowed, and if we were to run this, we can go into state C and D, but we can't go into state B. There's no way for the human to put us in state B. And, you know, here I've just constructed this with constants, but, you know, each one of these would really be some piece of logic. So, you know, maybe it's always safe to go into state D, and so you just always have a true here, um, but sometimes it's not safe to go into state B, so, and maybe you have to check the elevator height. And if the elevator height is above a certain height, we're going to put a false in. So based on <clears throat> the current robot state, we can allow or disallow any given states at any given time and prevent the human from going into them. Are there any questions on um, how to incorporate allowed and disallowed states into the state controller? And then the last thing here is sometimes we're allowed to go into a given state, but for whatever reason, we need to override the output of, you know, I'm gonna call this, this is the state controller itself. And this is the state selector. Sometimes we need to override the output of the state controller. So an example of that last year would be, uh, you know, we may have commanded the elevator to go up to rocket position three, but if we detected that we were tipping backwards with the IR sensor, we want to go ahead and drop the elevator back down. And uh, we did that with safety interlocks. And there's any number of ways that you can incorporate safety interlocks. We have chosen to do pretty much always one scheme for this because it's the most obvious to someone else looking at the code what's happening. And so what we do is we just take another case structure and for the false case, we do nothing to this value. it passes straight through. So this would be um, no, no issue 
And in the true case, this would be the you know issue detected. And we would put in some new value that we're going to override. In this case, if, it, if it, the elevator is tipping, we want to retract the elevator all the way back down to below its position. So <clears throat> we will uh, just create a control here and we'll call this robot tipping. And so now, if we look at that, and we go to state C, we're in 40, but as soon as we hold down, uh, as soon as we go into robot tipping, we override the output of that value. No matter what we press, we're still in, we're, we're still outputting a zero to the motors. And then as soon as we're not tipping anymore, we go back to uh, whatever state we were in, or whatever output we were in before. Um, and, you know, we could have done this with select blocks, we could have done this in any other way, but doing it with the case structure makes it really obvious to someone looking at your code that this is an interlock that's cutting things. And what we've done is, if we've got multiple things that need to change stuff, we can prioritize them, right? We'll, we'll do, we will, um, basically copy this structure and and just put them in order right so you can string together as many safety interlocks as you want So we'll just call this like, uh, I don't know, issue two. And maybe with issue two, what we should do is go do 15 inches off the ground. But um, if the robot is tipping and we have issue number two, we're going to do the higher priority uh, interlock. So this is the higher priority interlocks and this is a lower and so if we were to run this code again um, when we go to state C we have issue number two happen we're at <clears throat> 15 inches but if we tip we're at zero so uh, it's just a an easy way to, to, to visualize what's going on are there any questions on the safety interlocks and how we sort of string them together? Okay. Um, are there any questions on anything that we've covered with state controllers so far? Because we're about to move off the state controllers topic.